and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? Here in the book of Jeremiah, we are looking at a time in Israel's history where Judah is right at the end of their opportunity to turn back and receive God's blessing and forgiveness and all that he has for them. We spent some time looking through the prophet Isaiah and considering his ministry, and he ministered about 150 years before Jeremiah. So uh, Jeremiah comes on the scene. He's really the, the prophet who has that, that final position, that final role as the nation of Judah in their rebellion is completely conquered by Babylon uh, during the ministry and during the lifetime of Jeremiah. And so it's a crazy thing for Jeremiah to experience. And yet, as he is there, he is there to represent God. And as he expresses his emotions, we we find that Jeremiah accurately represents uh, God in many ways. and, And that's his call and his mission. And here, what the Lord speaks through Jeremiah is, well, about the astonishing state of the nation of Judah. And how surprising it is that they are where they are. I've titled the message this morning, What God Finds Astonishing. We need to consider this morning what astonishes God. What surprises God? Now, of course, we know that nothing surprises God in the sense that he knows all things. Uh, He knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. He knows all of the details of what's going to happen. There's nothing that God ever learns or discovers. Uh, God knows all things in that way. And yet we still find this expression throughout the scriptures of God being surprised or astonished, shocked, marveling, right? There was times in Jesus's ministry where he marveled at the unbelief or that the, at the faith of different people. And here God is expressing some astonishment through or to Jeremiah and through the prophet Jeremiah to the people of Judah. And what astonishes God should be something that causes us to pay attention to. It should be something that we are astonished by as well. Uh, But what if what astonishes God is, well, his own people? And that's what we see taking place place here in Jeremiah chapter 5. And so we're going to work our way through some thoughts here in these two verses, looking at what astonishes God. The first point to consider this morning is that his prophets speak falsely. Here's what astonishes God. What's astonishing to God is that he has prophets those who have been raised up to speak on his behalf, and yet they speak falsely. They speak what is untrue. They speak lies to the people. Again, verse 30 says, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The prophets prophesy falsely. Now, a quick look at the timeline. Again, I I mentioned it briefly, but um, here's the ministry of Jeremiah as far as the the timeline of Israel and Judah are concerned. That Isaiah, 150 years earlier, was preaching to Judah during the fall of the northern kingdom, but the southern kingdom continued on and had some pockets of revival, but they were on the same course, and God had been warning them of that. We saw that and we read that uh, in our passages in Jeremiah this week. But here's Jeremiah at the very end. He's, he's their last opportunity. And God is using Jeremiah to call out to the people. But one of the perplexing things about this time where Jeremiah is ministering is Babylon is coming and rising up and threatening and taking land and it's, it's looking eminent. You know, Babylon is going to conquer Judah. During this time, Jeremiah was not the only prophet there were many who would rise up and speak and say, thus says the Lord. There, would, there were many who were declaring in the Lord's name a variety of things. And, and notice what it says here in verse 31. Here, here's what's astonishing to God. The prophets prophesy falsely. I think it's interesting that it doesn't say the false prophets prophesy falsely. I think it's something for us to consider. It doesn't label them as false prophets, but it describes their message 
as false. I think if we think about it, right, it's not astonishing that false prophets prophesy falsely. Nobody's surprised when a false prophet prophesies falsely because, well, that's what false prophets do, right? We would expect that. When, when we see the world around us acting crazy, we have a tendency to be shocked and surprised by it. But in a lot of ways, we shouldn't be astonished by those things. We shouldn't be astonished when unbelievers act in ungodly fashion, right? That's, that's not that astonishing, but, but here what's astonishing, what, what causes God to speak up and to take note and to call us to pay attention is that the prophets speak falsely. It's the prophets, those who speak on behalf of the Lord, those who speak in the name of the Lord. This isn't just a little bit of you know, drama that I'm adding in to the, to the message you can see throughout the ministry of Jeremiah, he was genuinely confused. When God called him, back when he commissioned him in chapter one, he said, look, I've put my words and I'm gonna send you and they have hard faces. It's gonna be a difficult ministry because they're gonna be against you. And, and as you see that unfold in the chapters we read this week, in chapter four, Jeremiah speaks to the Lord and he says, Lord, you've greatly deceived this people because you've been saying you shall have peace. Jeremiah is genuinely confused because he has a message that Babylon is coming. They're going to be destroyed as a result of their sin. But the message that Jeremiah is familiar with, he's heard a hundred times before people on behalf of the Lord speaking in the name of the Lord saying, you shall have peace. And then here's Jeremiah and the Lord's told him, you will be destroyed. And Jeremiah is confused. Jeremiah is perplexed. He, he, He can't figure it out. He's wrestling with that, and and he does so throughout his ministry. We can see this again in Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. Jeremiah has this conversation with the Lord. He says, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. And the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Jeremiah, in his confusion, goes to God and says, I'm really confused about this, Lord, because this is a different message than what others are speaking on your behalf. They're saying you shall not see the sword and you're not going to experience famine. Don't worry about it. Things are going to be great. You will have peace and God will preserve you. That's what they're saying. But Jeremiah says that that's not the message that you've given me. And here the Lord clarifies it for Jeremiah. Here's, here's the issue, Jeremiah. These guys are speaking lies. The reason why you're confused is they're using my name, but they're saying something different. They're speaking lies, but claiming to speak on my behalf. This was something that is prevalent throughout these final days for the nation of Judah. And as we consider these things this morning, I, I think it's important for us to understand this isn't the first time that people have had the authority as a prophet of the Lord, had the title, the position, the role, seen by and esteemed as prophets of the Lord, speaking on behalf of the Lord, and yet speaking lies in the name of the Lord. This isn't the first time that happened here in Jeremiah's time. And it's not the last time that it's happened either. Over the past few weeks, I've been kind of, contemplating this a bit more, paying attention to some news that has been surfacing. And I don't know uh, if you've been keeping up with these things, but it caught my attention uh, a few weeks back, a man by the name of Joshua Harris. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but a long time ago in the 90s, he wrote the book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And if you were a you know, Christian teenager during that time, you like, you know, everybody knew about that book. It was like, you know, 
blowing people's minds. It was so incredibly amazing. Or, you know, that's what people were saying about it. (laughs) But he became incredibly popular, had this huge platform, had this huge opportunity. Now he goes on to pastor a church, a mega church. It's this, you know, huge, awesome opportunity and ministry. And just recently he announced that he is separating permanently from his wife. And then shortly after that, he made another announcement and he said, well, actually, let me clarify. The reason why all this is happening is because I, I don't think I'm a Christian anymore. I've decided that I'm not. So there's a few articles that you could consider, but there's this one from the, the Christian Post where Joshua Harris says, I'm not a Christian. By all the ways I know how to measure it, by all the ways I know how to you know, think about it, I'm not a Christian. And and he's not saying that remorsefully or, you know, in tragedy, but just that's the reality. I'm, I'm turning away from those things that I once taught, those things that I once held to. And he had to, this to say to those who are Christians. He said, to my Christian friends, I'm grateful for your prayers. Don't take it personally if I don't immediately return calls. I can't join in your mourning. I don't view this moment negatively. I feel very much alive and awake and surprisingly hopeful. The thing with Joshua Harris that I think is important for us to consider is not so much the man, not so much, you know, the old and what, you know, the value of his previous ministry and resources and all of that. But, but the interesting thing to consider is he's changing positions radically, but maintaining the publicity, maintaining the influence, the, the audience that he has. And, and here you have, I would suggest, prophets speaking falsely. As believers who've been around for a while, we, we kind of anticipate and we kind of expect there to be, you know, a lot of falseness in some TV programs and some of those who claim, right? But, but it is astonishing to the Lord and it should be astonishing to us. It's tragic and confusing, but it happens that those who have ministries, those who have been used by God, those who have been prophets, sometimes they change course. And they begin to speak falsely. They begin to turn away from things that they once proclaimed. They, they change course. It, this is... One example, it's just one example of many. It caught my attention because, well, I I knew the guy, not personally, but, you know, I was familiar with his work. And then this last week, there was another announcement by a prominent person, a popular person. His name is Marty Sampson. And he's not so popular and famous that, you know, you are necessarily aware of who he is, but... He has uh, been part of the Hillsong worship movement for uh, maybe 20 years or so, written a number of songs, and he also has come out with an announcement saying, you know, I don't think I'm a Christian anymore either. He wrote, you're going to know this song, right? Jesus, I believe in you, and I would go to the ends of the earth, right? You know that song. He, he was one of the authors of that song. Another song, standing here in your presence, thinking of the good things you have done. Remember, you know that song. He wrote that song. Now, after some time has passed, I think he's in his early 40s now, he makes this announcement. This article came out in Relevant Magazine this past week. Hillsong songwriter Marty Sampson says he's losing his Christian faith. And there's a lot of things that, you know, we're not getting into regarding that. But here's here's a quote from him directly. All I know is what's true to me right now. And Christianity just seems to me like another religion at this point. Love and forgive? Absolutely. Be kind? Absolutely. Be generous and do good to others? Absolutely. Some things are good no matter what you believe. 
one who, you know, proclaimed great truths and spoke on behalf of the Lord and led us in worship in, uh, you know, many ways and wrote songs that we sing to the Lord. And now what's coming forth is false prophecy. Now, the, the thing that I think is semi-good, if you can kind of find a little bit of a light here in the midst of these, you know, dark examples, is that they're not trying to pretend to still be Christian and then, you know, proclaim these things. But, but at the same time, they're still allowing their influence, their audience, to be impacted by the things that they are saying. And so there is this turning, there is this, well, these prophets, these who once spoke on behalf of the Lord, who are now saying something different. Now, if you've been following along those things, then you probably also saw the response from John Cooper. He's the lead singer for Skillet, and uh, man, he had a meaty, packed, like, incredible uh, little thing to say. Not little, actually, it was kind of lengthy, but uh, on his Facebook page, he, he had it. Here's a little quote from that, and I just want to read this uh, real quick. It says, It is time for the church to rediscover the preeminence of the word and to value the teaching of the word. We need to value truth over feeling, truth over emotion. And what we are seeing now is the result of the church raising up influencers who did not supremely value truth and who have led a generation who also do not believe in the supremacy of truth. And now those disavowed leaders are proudly still leading and influencing boldly away from the truth. He, he had some really insightful things and coming from, you know, uh, the, the musician arena, it, it was pertinent and valuable to consider that he was saying, look, we're, we're you know, many Christians are basing their theology on songs that 20-year-old uh, Christians or worship leaders wrote, you know, popular songs. And, 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 and we're, foundation, we're founding our lives on what is popular, what is catchy, and uh, not necessarily on what is true. And he says, look, we need to get back to the word of God. It's important for us, guys. We need to have a solid foundation in the word of God. And we need to understand, we need to recognize that there is this reality. Sometimes the prophets of God speak falsely. Whether they were never sent from God to begin with, or whether they were sent by God and used by God and then later turned and changed their mind, sometimes the prophets of God speak falsely. And here's Jeremiah genuinely confused because what he is receiving from the Lord is not matching up with the popular message of the day. And God says, well, there's no real confusion, actually. They, they're speaking lies. They're speaking falsely. And so we need to understand this for one side is to be aware of the reality and to be on our guard against those who are speaking falsely in, on behalf of the Lord or in the name of the Lord but we also need to be aware of this for our own sakes because in some capacity, you are a prophet for God. You are. You speak on behalf of God. You have authority and influence. You have a ministry from God. And God has placed you in people's lives well, with that role of a prophet. A, a prophet doesn't necessarily tell the future. A prophet speaks on behalf of God. And there are some people in your life, you are that person to them. You are that role for them. You can see this illustrated in Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission. Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Here's the call, the commission to every disciple of Jesus. It's go make disciples. That puts you in the place of speaking on behalf of God. Jesus says, teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. You go represent me. Tell them what I've taught you. Tell them what I have told you. Make disciples. What's astonishing to God 
is when we use that role, use that place that God has given to us, and instead of speaking on behalf of God, instead of speaking the truth, we, we say what we think, we say what we want, we say what we hope is true, we speak our feelings, we speak what's popular, we speak what we've been taught, but we don't speak the truth. I don't know about you, but I don't want God to be astonished at what I say. You're a prophet for God. Don't astonish the Lord by speaking falsely. Well, moving on to the second point for us to consider this morning. Point number two is his leaders rely on themselves. Here's what God finds astonishing. He finds it astonishing that his leaders... People who have authority in his plan and in his purposes, his leaders who have access to the resources of God, his leaders, instead of relying upon the Lord and his power, they rely upon themselves. Again, verse 30, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule by their own power. God says this is astonishing. Not only are there, is there this group of people speaking in my name. That are, they're just saying lies. But also there is the priests. Now this word priests. It, it, it speaks of a ruler. It, it could be a priest or a prince. Uh, any type of person or position of authority really. Now the priests did have authority in the kingdom, they were uh, judges, they were authorities in the land. And so it's uh, appropriate and, and uh, applies either way. Here's, here's the leaders of God. Those who have authority amongst the people of God. And God says, they rule by their own power. They're using their own resources their own insights, their own wisdom, their own thoughts, their own plans. And they're basing their decisions, they're basing their rule on themselves. Even the priests, even the religious leaders are ruling by their own power. Listen, this has always been a problem. Again, it wasn't the first time, you know, that it's happened here in Jeremiah's day and it's not the last time. Jesus addressed this as well. In Matthew chapter 23 with the religious leaders. Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you observe, or tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. Jesus said, look, they have the role and the position of authority. They sit in Moses' seat. So in that light, and because of that, when they instruct you, you need to follow that. At the same time, don't follow their example because they don't practice what they preach. They say, and they do not do. They are, well, speaking falsely, but in a different way. They're, they're speaking the truth, but they're not living the truth, Jesus says. They're speaking on behalf of Moses. They're, they're communicating the word of God, but, but their lives are different. They're not about the plan of God. They're not interested in the purposes of God. They are, they're ruling by themselves. Seeking to accomplish their plans and their purposes. They were interested in their popularity, in their prestige, in their wealth. They were interested in themselves. They were working out their own ideas and thoughts and plans. And so Jesus says, you have, to, you have to put on a filter here and pay attention. They, they have that role. You can't just rebel against that role. They have the authority of Moses, but they don't live out according to what they preach. For us, as we consider these things today, do you wonder if God's astonished at our leaders 
Y you could think about this politically. You know, politically, it's hard for me to get excited about any candidate, any time. <laughs> Whether it was the last presidential election or the next one or the one before that or the one that will come later. It's hard for me to get excited because they rule by their own power. I mean, I know that the, a lot of them say that, you know, they don't and that they, you know, put the Lord first and all of that. And I just don't believe them. I, I, am, I am hard, it's hard for me to be persuaded that any political candidate, not that it's impossible, but I like to wait and see. <laughs> Proof's in the pudding, right? Well, let's see. And so far, I haven't seen anybody really live up to uh, all of the ideals and morals and things that have been declared in advance, right? Uh, it's hard for me to get excited about political candidate. Now, for some people, they get really excited. They get really immersed. But I, I kind of liken it to, look, it's still important to be part of the process, right? Uh, I, I liken it to loving a hammer. I have this one hammer. I, I forgot to bring it this morning. I love this hammer. I mean, it's like, it's a framing hammer. I got it. It was on clearance for like $13 one time. But everything that, you know, we've had to do around here and everything, I, this hammer was like, it, it was my right hand man. You know, it was like, this thing is great. It is like amazing. It's wonderful. I love it. But, you know, realistically, you don't have to love your hammer. Even if you're using a hammer all day long, put any other hammer in my hand, could have done exactly the same job around you. You know what I mean? Like, it's not that important. I don't have to love my hammer to do the work. And in a similar way, I think when it comes to political leaders and political candidates, I'm very cautious to love them. They're just tools. And I don't mean that in the insult way. Maybe I do. But yeah, we, we need to participate. We need to practice it. Be part of the opportunities that God has given to us. But we also don't have to be like, oh, I love this hammer, right? It's like this hammer is going to save the world. Well, probably not. But I'm going to try to do the best I can with the lousy tools I've got, right? That's kind of my approach to politics. It's a lot of people relying upon themselves, their wisdom, their ideas, not hearing from the Lord, not receiving from the Lord. And that's probably not that astonishing to the Lord or to us because, again, it's not astonishing when unbelievers practice ungodliness and don't seek the Lord. That's, that's not that astonishing. You bring it closer to home, though, and we can consider church leaders, and it becomes more astonishing. And for us today, this is something important to consider. Again, as those who are called to make disciples, as those who are involved in the things of God, in the things of the church, in the work of God, it astonishes God when his leaders rely upon themselves and rule by their own authority and by their own ideas and not based on the resources and the power of God. I think this quote from A.W. Tozer is important for us to consider. He says, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we, do, what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. This is something we ought to consider. Again, you're a leader. You're involved. You're engaged in the work of God. How much of what you do is by your own power? How much of what I do is by my own power? Who are we relying upon to do the work that we are doing? You're a leader. You're an influencer. Be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You can think about a Sunday school teacher, right? Kids ministry teacher. Rule by the Spirit's power. Can you do Sunday school without the Holy Spirit? Can you do kids' ministry without the Holy Spirit? You know what? School teachers prove that you can every day, right? Daycare companies and centers, they, they prove that you can do it without the Holy Spirit. In fact, teenage girls, you know, neighbors down the street babysit kids and without the power of the Holy Spirit. That, that it's not something that requires the Holy Spirit to, 
Just because it's happening doesn't mean that it's fueled by, empowered by, influenced by, and led by the Holy Spirit. God is astonished when Sunday school teachers rule by their own power and not by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is astonished when ushers rule by their own power. Now, can you be an usher and rule by your own power and do it in your own strength? Yes, janitors prove it every day, right? Sorry, guys, I didn't mean to insult you. But yeah, we can. We can, do, there's, there's, especially when we've been around for a while, I can give a talk. I don't know how persuasive or impactful it would be, but I could give a talk without the Holy Spirit. I have to talk at work. Now, I'm grateful that the Holy Spirit helps me at work, but there's a lot of people at work who talk and they don't have the Holy Spirit and they still can talk. They can still motivate. They can still stir up. They can still, you know, make a difference in that regard, make an impact in that way. We need to be very careful that we always go back to rely upon the Lord especially as we're seeking to do his work. When his leaders rely on themselves, God finds that astonishing. It is shocking. How dare you? How could you? Why would you rely upon your wisdom, your strength, and your resources? But I think the false prophets or the prophets speaking lies and the leaders ruling by their own resources I think those things are not nearly as astonishing as the next part of the verse, and it gives us point number three. Here's what God finds astonishing. His people prefer false prophets and ungodly leaders. His people prefer these ministries. Again, verse 30, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. I think what's most astonishing of all of these is that God's people love and embrace the false message, the human plan, the human energy, relying upon our own resources and ideas rather than the Lord. God says, my people prefer that. They love it. Now again, this wasn't the first time God's people would find themselves in that condition. It's not the last time either. Paul tells us this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. This is a condition Not just then, but it's a condition today where people refuse sound doctrine. No, I don't want to hear that. I would love, I would prefer to have these other kinds of teachers. And they will heap up for themselves. They're going to have whole piles of teachers that will tell them things that they like to hear, that they want to hear, but that are not actually the true words of God. God is astonished when his people prefer false prophets and ungodly leaders. It's something to pay attention to because we have the capacity to find ourselves in this position as well. We're vulnerable to this. We can stop enduring sound doctrine. These examples that I shared earlier in the service, There are those in the Christian community who would say they were never believers, you know, they were never true, you know, true in the faith. They they were never, and some of those things you you don't really know, the Lord only knows, right? But at the same time, I, I would suggest that just like them, we have that potential of coming to a place where I used to endure sound doctrine, but I don't endure that anymore. I don't want to hear the truth. I don't want to be told those things. I don't want to be instructed in those ways, I would rather just have 
well, and something that's nice and pleasant and fits well with my ideas and is, you know, popular, or exciting, or whatever the case may be, we can come to that place where we decide to no longer endure sound doctrine and begin to heap up. And so we fill our mind with, we fill our, you know, reading materials with, we fill our listening materials with those that are nicer, more pleasant perhaps, and less and less of sound doctrine. Pastor Charles Spurgeon said, if God's own people did not tolerate false doctrine, it would soon cease to be heard in many places. But it is when those who profess to know God's word endorse that which is contrary to the truth that error is kept in power in the land. It's interesting to consider, right? It's kind of like supply and demand. Look, if we, if we wouldn't consume it, they wouldn't be producing it. But there's a mass demand for false doctrine. There's a mass demand for lies that sound good. Listen, the lies that the prophets in Jeremiah's day were speaking, oh yeah, that's, they sounded great. I mean, here they are in, in, in facing this great threat, Babylon, and they're on the verge of destruction, and the prophets are saying, trust in the Lord. You are going to have peace and victory, and there's not going to be a sword that enters in, and it's like, yes, I want to hold, oh, that's great. Yes, tell me those good things. The problem was that it was keeping them in a position of unrepentant hearts. They, the, they were in sin. They were rebelling against God. And, and so they said, look, we don't have to repent because we have these promises from God. Good is going to happen. Everything's going to work out together for good. You know, it looks bad, but it's all going to work out. And so we don't have to repent. We don't have to turn from our ways. We don't have to turn back to God and follow him the way that he's instructed us. No, we can continue to live the way that we're living And so the people preferred to hear the lie. They preferred to be deceived. They they preferred the fluff. They didn't want to hear the truth. This is something that we need to be on guard against. And so when it comes to things that people say, when it comes to ministry that is taking place and counsel that is given, word that is being taught, proclamations that are being made, what I would encourage you to do is to see for yourself. I think this point here is people prefer false prophets and ungodly leaders should remind us and stir us up to that need for us to check the word of God for ourselves to evaluate what it is that we're receiving, what it is that we're hearing, and, and to use the word of God as the standard by which we determine whether or not that is worth receiving, whether or not that is the truth. Not how we feel about it, not how it stirs our heart or makes us cry or makes us laugh or makes us whatever, not, not how we feel about it, not what we think about it, not how excited we are about the message, but, but how does it line up with the word of God. You need to learn to see for yourself and be a student of the word of God. Because any one of us, well, we can be vulnerable to tuning out true doctrine, sound doctrine, and instead replacing that with false doctrine. You don't just, nobody just tunes out sound doctrine and then that's it. But it's, it's replaced. That's the danger of not seeking out the truth of God's word. Sound doctrine is replaced with false doctrine. The prophet Isaiah in his ministry, Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 declares, To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Go back to the word of God. If they don't speak according to this, it's because there's no light in them, God says. You need to check what you're being told. You need to check what is being said by the word of God. And if they're not speaking according to the word of God, God says there's no light in them. 
Don't pay attention to them. Don't listen to them. You need to use the word of God as the standard. Because sometimes prophets prophesy falsely. Now, that idea that prophets might one day prophesy falsely sometimes causes us to go to an extreme and say, well, we need to shut down all prophecy then. And this concept, you know, I've been burned once and so I'm not going to receive from others or let people speak into my life ever again. That's an exaggerated reaction. That's not what God is calling us to do. Instead, here's what the Lord says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And then he says, Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good. God says, Look, you don't just like cast out prophecy and quench the spirit because you've been burned in the past or had bad experiences or you've seen big leaders fall or whatever. Don't throw out all the old stuff, don't throw out those who stand up to speak, those who would speak into your life, don't throw that out. But here's what you need to do. Test all things. Check it out for yourself. See for yourself. What does the word of God have to say? We find a good example of this in Acts chapter 17, verse 11 with the Bereans. And it says that they were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness And search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They sought the Lord in the scriptures to double check the ministry of the Apostle Paul, the teaching of the Apostle Paul. Is this really true? We need to check for ourselves. And they searched the scriptures daily. God is astonished when we just receive what other people say about him. And we just accept it. We just take it. We just receive it. We just believe it. And we don't go back to the scriptures to verify the truth. Listen, don't take my word for any of this. Don't take a popular song's word for it. Don't take the massive crowd. There's great movements and great pressure for people, for Christians to say things that are completely contrary to the scriptures. And and there is a lot in the Christian community who are falling prey to that. And we see whole congregations making huge decisions that that are contrary to the word of God. And I'm not going to get into all those, but, but the point is we need to be men and women of the word who who have learned how to evaluate, to read these things for ourselves. I think we need to kind of have an automatic response. You know, someone starts saying, hey, the Bible says, and then we need to respond, where? Where does the Bible say that? Man, there's so many occasions, this happens to me all the time, we're in a conversation, and someone says, the Bible says this, right? And then there's this whole other argument, there's this whole other thing that's built on top of that. But a lot of times, what they're saying here, the Bible says, and then what they say next try to challenge where is that actually found in the bible it's like well it's kind of a combination of things that have been heard and it's like this tower of cards or whatever it's like you know this this concept and okay well this and then we'll build this on that concept and build this on that concept and build that on that concept and and pretty soon what we have is the telephone game we're far removed from what the bible actually says but all the while we're declaring this is what the bible says but where does the bible say that We need to go back to the word of God. God says this. I think we need to have an automatic response. Where? Where does God say that? It needs to be something that we do consistently and regularly. Go and check out. Test all things. There's popular messages given in the name of God. Given in the name of love. Given in the name of kindness and goodness and forgiveness. There's popular messages there's great things we celebrate our quote-unquote progressiveness all surrounding things that are not what god actually says god's people prefer false prophets and ungodly leaders that's astonishing don't let that be you check it out for yourself 
get into the word of God and verify the truth for yourself. Well, the final thing to consider as we finish up here, point number four is his people do not consider their end. Here you have the false prophets. You have the priests ruling by their own power. You have the people who love these lies and these ungodly leaders. But God says there at the end of verse 31, but what will you do in the end? Listen, we're all going to stand before God and it might feel nice to live in a delusion. It might be nice to live in a fantasy and to not think about the consequences and to not figure out the truth. It might be kind of a nice, easy, fluffy life. But what are you going to do in the end? Because the truth is in the end, we all will stand before God. In Romans chapter 14, Paul says, it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. We will all stand before God and give an account. The prophet who prophesies falsely will give account. The leader, the ruler who rules by their own power, they will give account. The people who believe the lies and accept these things that are not of God, they they will stand before God and give account. We need to consider our end. What will you do in the end? Living in a fantasy, it's it's great. Ignorance is bliss, you know? It's just, yeah, this is so much easier. But what are you going to do in the end? You're going to stand before God. You're going to give an account. All things are naked and open to him. There's no excuses. There's no good reasons. There's only the truth. What God finds astonishing His prophets speak falsely. Make sure that you speak God's word, that you bring forth the truth. His leaders rely upon themselves. Let's make sure that we lead, that we do the work that God has called us to by his strength and his power, his course, his leading, his methods, his ways, and not our own. Let's make sure that we filter what it is that we're receiving, that we do not prefer false prophets and ungodly leaders and keep up teachers that just itch our ears and make us feel good, but that we would prefer to hear the truth and that we would verify for ourselves that it is the truth that we're hearing and receiving. God finds it astonishing when we do not consider our end. Every day, every decision, we should be reflecting on our end. We will stand before God to give account. For every idle word, Jesus says, for every action, for every decision, for what we receive and what we don't receive, we need to remember eternity and to prepare ourselves daily to stand before the Lord. Let's not astonish God. Let's be his people genuinely who hear from him and walk in his ways. Let's pray. God, I pray for us this morning. And Lord, it is easy to fall prey to these deceptions and these things that, well, they sound so good. And we want to, we we desperately want to believe many of those things that are going around. But Lord, I pray that you would give us your wisdom and insight. Lord, that we would look beyond the moment, we would look beyond the feelings, we would look beyond the things that we see right in front of us. And that we would look to eternity and believe you and what you say above all else. Because you're really the only one who knows the truth. So God, help us to run to you. Help us to be your people who speak forth your word. And I pray, God, that you would fill us with your words, that we might be your agents, be your prophets, and to speak on your behalf to the people around us. I pray, Lord, that you would help us as we have 
positions of authority and influence in people's lives. Protect us, God, from ruling by our own power, by our own resources. And Lord, I pray that you would highlight in our minds and hearts where that is the case. Lord, that we would be able to turn from that and come back to a reliance upon you and your Holy Spirit. Lord, would you work mightily and move mightily within us and through us. I pray that you would help us to develop discipline. Lord, that we would check your word, that your word would be the standard by which we evaluate everything we receive, everything we're taught, all the counsel that we're given. Help us, God, to value your word, to believe it, and to hold fast to it. And I pray, God, that you would continually put eternity upon our hearts and minds. Lord, we are living very short lives compared to eternity. And yet we have the tendency to be focused and consumed with this life and have very little attention for the next. Help us, God, to have the right perspective and proportions or that eternity would be upon our minds and hearts, that we would be living according to you and your word with the recognition of standing before you. We will stand before you and give account. And Lord, if we've been faithful, if we've walked with you, Lord, we will have all eternity to enjoy the benefits and blessings of the work that you accomplished in us and through us here. I pray that you would work these things out in our lives. Draw us near to you. In Jesus' name. I want to leave it open now and just continue in a time of prayer. Um, you can.